Hey everyone, welcome to the EMS Academy. Um, for those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and an ICU physician at Hopkins. I am an active member at Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company and have the honor of serving as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of the medical director's office, the EMS office, Chief Nats, EMS Training Academy staff, and Captain Lenny Stewart, thank you for what you guys do every day to help our community. And thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. Big shout out to Ashley Brooks, a young member for Pikesville, who's helping us with the Zoom platform. Ashley, towards the end of this training, we'll put a link in the, uh, the chat. Click on the link, fill out some information and get your MIMS CEUs. If you have any questions or challenges with, any questions about the MIMS CEU process, your record of participation, or any challenges with doing the um, link tonight, please stay on with us after the training. Uh, we need to resolve any um, uh, uh, sign-in uh, glitches uh, before we close out tonight. Uh, super excited to have back with us again, uh, Trooper Adam Murray. Adam Murray is a trooper and flight medic with Maryland State Police Aviation Command and was a firefighter paramedic with Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County from 2018 to 2023. Adam started his career at the Cumberland Road Fire Department in Fayetteville, North Carolina in 2008. He then worked as a paramedic for Durham County, North Carolina from 2011 to 2016, prior to joining MSP. Adam has been in the Aviation Command since 2017, working primarily at Troopers 2 and 7. He's currently assigned to the Aviation Command's medical training section. Adam, thanks for joining us. And thank you, as always, for yeah building programs where you're at to make care across the state better and for sharing uh, yeah what, what we need to learn uh, with us here tonight. We super appreciate it. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to talk to you guys. Um, this, uh, so uh, a lot of updates that I'm going to talk about here throughout this presentation have been a long time coming. Uh, the whole blood program, I know uh, Dr. Flocair, our medical director, and uh, Sergeant Josh Hines, our uh, QA officer, have been working tirelessly on bringing this. Uh, they've probably met with some of you guys that are in the chat uh, at some point. Uh, but they've been working on this for probably the last uh, five to seven years of trying to bring this program uh, to fruition. So it's exciting to have it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about it. Um, I highly encourage, uh, I went back and listened to uh, and watched Dr. Sikorsky's lecture uh, a couple couple weeks back uh, in the chat um, or in this program about uh, the logistics and the, the science of whole blood transfusion. A uh, huge shout out to that. I highly encourage you guys to go uh, check that one. I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to it a couple times, um, but that's also a great resource. So the objectives tonight, we're going to discuss uh, our new whole blood transfusion program. Uh, we're going to discuss some changes to our ability to take missions in inclement weather uh, in what's called instrument flight conditions. Uh, and we're going to review some of our capabilities in non-traditional, so to speak, uh, uh, missions like aerial rescue and search. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about landing zone safety and operations. And throughout this whole thing kind of sprinkled in, I'm going to talk a bunch about just the logistics of getting the resources that we have on board to your patient uh, so that we can help you out. So uh, bottom line up front, uh, we have whole blood and now on board all seven aircraft. So uh, we started the program, we started carrying two units each of whole blood on Troopers 1 and Trooper 2 uh, on May 10th, so uh, starting last month. Um, earlier this week, uh, we actually just decided to spread out some of that blood, and now we have one unit on all seven aircraft. So that was a decision that was made jointly between us and the blood bank. We are going to eventually have two units on each aircraft. But for the time being, we figured uh, one's better than none, and we'd spread that out. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but almost all the patients that we've transfused to so far, uh, basically all of them have only required a single unit of blood, and that's been enough to uh, temporize them and get them to definitive care. So as of yesterday, when I checked, uh, we've had 921 tra patients transported throughout the state in our, in our aircraft this so far this year. Of those, 80 met the criteria for blood transfusion laid out in Maryland protocol. Um, and then of those 80, eight have received uh, whole blood. Now, all of those eight are basically the, the prior 72 of those were before we were actually carrying the whole blood. So as soon as we had it on board, uh, every aircraft that basically had it uh, where it was, was administering that blood. 
Um, and then, like I said, as of uh, Tuesday this past week, uh, all seven bases have one unit of uh, whole blood on the aircraft for immediate transfusion. So our goal of this program is to uh, treat that severe hemorrhage uh, and give back what the patients are missing. So we're going to talk a bunch about what the patients miss uh, when they when they lose blood. Uh, but the key thing here is that we're not going to put back, uh, as so many people lovingly call it, pasta water, right? We're not putting back uh, salt water. We're not putting back sodium chloride. We're not putting back ringers or anything like that. We're putting back uh, whole blood that carries the uh, that has an oxygen ca uh, carrying capacity and a capacity to assist the patient in forming clots. It would. Um, so. As with any EMS class, we're going to start off with a scenario. So this is a, a loosely based on a patient that I transported. This is the first one that I uh, transfused blood to. So uh, just kind of loosely based, like I said, no identifying information, anything like that. But it's a 70-year-old female with a head-on MVC. On your primary assessment, when you get uh, get patient contact, get a, a finally a, get a good look at her. The uh, injuries that you've identified. She's got periorbital ecchymosis and a large hematoma to the left side of the head. So potentially uh, some sort of head trauma mixed in as well. Bilateral femur fracture. The femur fracture on the right is open and has severe bleeding. Uh, the right tib fib is also broken. Um, and then she's got tenderness to palpation on the pelvis. And uh, because she is awake and talking a little bit, GCS of like 14, uh, she's able to tell you that she has a fib uh, and she is taking Eliquis. So, um, this is pretty. This is a kind of a kind of a standard patient for us in aviation as a as a primarily trauma service, right? These kind of calls are common for us, uh, but this uh, sh you know always gives us a little bit of cause for concern. She's got multiple routes where she could have severe internal hemorrhage, both internal and external, and the addition of the uh, eloquence makes her uh, far far more likely to bleed severely. Uh, so this is a patient that I'm immediately going to have a very low threshold and a very like high uh, index of suspicion that she's going to need some sort of blood products either from me or at the hospital or both. Talking a little bit about the pathophysiology that's going on with this patient. So she's losing blood and that's more than just losing volume. It's not dehydration. It's not uh, sepsis or anything like that. The loss of blood out onto the street or out into places that it's not supposed to be out of your vasculature. Uh, has going to have more negative effects than just the loss of actual volume itself. You're going to lose your oxygen carrying capacity, as well as your as well as a significant amount of clotting factors. The longer that trauma process goes on, the more blood you lose, the more deep the deeper you go into that profound hemorrhagic shock, the harder it is to resuscitate you. The more blood products that you need, and the more complications that you're going to have. Giving that crystalloid fluid to try and fix that is, uh, it's like trying to fill your gas tank with water, right? Uh, it will add volume, but it's not what your car needs. Uh, and that's exactly kind of what, you know, what's going on here. The longer the evidence has gone on and, and the more that we kind of learn about trauma resuscitation, the more that we're realizing that really crystalloid fluid is probably on the, uh, on the harmful end of things. Um, so one of the things that we really don't want to see is we're, right, we're going to talk a lot about what I want to see from, uh, from ground EMS units on turnover and things like that. One of the things we don't really like to see is, hey, uh, they had one soft blood pressure, so we dumped uh, two liters of ringers into them. Uh, and now their pressure's you know, 130 over 90, uh, they're feeling good. Um, that's not exactly the, the most, uh, most effective approach anymore. Um, so that's an important thing to, con to consider. So looking at the history of blood product administration, and this is really important because some people talk about, oh, whole blood is this new, and it's really not. Uh, it's we're kind of going back to what uh, has what, what worked the first time. So the uh, you know the history of blood transfusion kind of starts around like 1900. You've got the Carl Landsteiner discovering uh, A, B, and O blood types, um, and then you're starting to get like the first transfusion is 1907. Uh, Ruben Ottenberg he performed the first blood transfusion, and he used typed and cross matched whole blood. Right, there wasn't any other products, there wasn't anything else. So you're talking 1910s whole blood. Um, that's what we were using through uh, through World War One, 1916. That's first blood banks and blood depots. Um, Basically, it's uh, this kind of progresses like this up until like the 60s when somebody when people we start trying to figure out uh, as you know, as humans do, is there a better way? So the idea and the issue has always been with blood is the limited supply 
and its shelf life and storage. So, you know, uh, originally people were like, hey, a whole blood works great. It's, it's good. Give, give the patient right back what they need. But the problem is you can't store it in an effective way to have it available at the patient's side. And then you don't have enough of it to give out. So we're looking for better ways. So one of the better ways that we tried was clear fluids. So that lactated ringers, things like that. That's where you get your two large bore IVs, throw a liter of fluid through each one and haul ass to the hospital, right? That's where we get those protocols that uh, kind of came out of that 60s era. As time progresses, we also figured out that, hey, if we break the blood into components, so if we take it into the platelets, the plasma and the packed red cells, we can store it for longer and then we can give patients just what they need. So if we have a patient who's anemic, we can give them one component. If we have the patient that uh, needs trauma resuscitation, we can give them another. So we have, uh, a, a, um, we have a lot of different options for uh, giving the patient exactly what they need. And ultimately this kind of continues as we go through uh, up until we get into the uh, the, the kind of uh, late 2000s uh, uh, in your uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, Operation Enduring Freedom in Af Afghanistan, uh, where we start to see whole blood make a resurgence. Um, people start to figure out that like the, the outcomes are better. And there's, a, there's started to be a significant amount of data that's been built out that in a trauma situation in particular, it's better to give the patient exactly the whole blood that they've lost. Uh, and then we are starting to figure out ways to make that uh, efficient, effective, and, and, and safe to give for patients. So some of the benefits of whole blood transfusion over component therapy is that you have a balanced resuscitation. There's been a lot of trials about, all right, do you give a unit of platelets, a unit of plasma, a unit of, of packed red cells in a one to one to one ratio, or do you give one to one to two or uh, you know any number of other ratios? And the reality is one to one to one seems to work pretty well. And then, uh, but the problem is then you have three bags and you have to keep cold three bags and you have to spike three bags and you have to warm three bags. Uh, so the whole blood takes care of everything in one, black, in one bag. So you improve the efficiency of actually getting a transfusion on board. Uh, and it's significantly simpler uh, for time to reduce and time to administer. Uh, there's also been uh, studies and trials with um, uh, plasma in particular with um, for, uh, for trauma resuscitation in, uh, in the airborne, in the air medical setting, uh, plasma by itself uh, does have some benefit to it. Uh, it contains a lot of the clotting factors, but ultimately whole blood's gonna be, gonna be the better one. And one of these trials in particular, the proper trial, they were, they were uh, testing basically one to one to one versus one to one to two uh, in these component therapies. And one of the things that they identified through the subgroup analysis throughout the study was that the coagulopathy, the derangement of your uh, coagulation as your, uh, as your trauma state, uh, as the time that you're in shock is prolonged, gets worse. And it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, so they were, they were able to figure out that every minute of delay between the activation of that tr massive transfusion protocol and the arrival of the first blood cooler, regardless of the ratio, increased the odds of mortality by 5%. So it's a, there's a significant benefit to getting this transfusion started as early as possible for the patients that need it the most. So back to the scenario, right? We have this patient who is uh, potentially trapped in a vehicle. We haven't really discussed that element yet, but potentially trapped in a vehicle, seriously injured. She's got an open femur fracture, an open ankle fracture, an unstable pelvis, um, right, we haven't even, I haven't really given any details about what might be going on in her chest, but with a high mechanism injury like that, we must, we probably should be assessing for tension pneumothorax or hemothorax. So we've got a lot of things going on. Well, what are our priorities? Well, first and foremost, we got to control external hemorrhage, right? Putting back blood is great, but preventing the patient from bleeding is even better, right? Um, so it's really important, right? It's nice that we have blood to, to, to put back in patients, but we, it's important for us not to get ahead of ourselves. We have to still remember we need to aggressively find and treat hemorrhage uh, by stopping it. So controlling your external hemorrhage. Uh, we're going to use tourniquets, right? So for a extremity hemorrhage that is severe life-threatening in the, in, the uh, in the eyes of the EMS provider, place a tourniquet. Place, uh, place it um, you'll hear the difference between two to three inches above the wound versus high and tight in the limb. Uh, we talk a lot about that with our law enforcement partners. High and tight is what, typically what you're going to see in the law enforcement and military setting because we're talking about care under fire if there's a threat to us. 
for you guys in the EMS world, if you've got the time and the uh, and the bandwidth to really assess and, and view a wound, we're going to put it two to three inches above the uh, above the injury. If that it gets to a joint space, and you're going to put it two to three inches uh, two to three inches above that next proximal joint. Um, and you want to tighten it down uh, significantly, right? We get a lot of uh, improperly placed tourniquets uh, when we get handover from uh, from EMS units. Either they were placed uh, kind of a little too uh, too hastily on like a, a wound that maybe didn't need it, or they are not tightened down far enough or things like that. So get those tourniquets on. If you're gonna use them, uh, it needs to be a, um, a committed kind of intervention. Uh, so you really need to commit to it and get it in there um, and tighten it down really, really uh, tight. Wound packing is also really important. So right after tourniquets, um, get uh, get your wound packing in there, right? So get into that wound. Uh, you're going to have to try and pack and fill that wound void. If you've got a hemostatic agent available to you, get that down to the bottom. So get that hemostatic agent in, the, in first, put your packing gauze on top of that, and then get a really tight pressure dressing on that. Um, wound packing is really good for some of these wounds that are large, that are gaping, and that uh, are not amenable to a tourniquet. So maybe they're high, they're up in the buttock or something like that. Key thing to remember is that we're not packing the, we're not packing the chest cavity. Uh, so if you're up at like uh, in the clavicles and the ribs up in that area or areas that it could be up into the chest cavity, we don't want to pack that. Pelvic binders. Uh, pelvic binders, you should have a very low threshold to place a pelvic binder. Uh, in a lot of cases with aviation, if we have an unconscious patient with a very high mechanism and a soft blood pressure, they seem like they're tachycardic, we're probably going to put it on a pelvic binder uh, either way. Um, the study on that, right, there's a there's a one study in particular, and I'm trying to remember the name of it, but um, they found basically orthopedic surgeons had about a 50-50 shot of identifying on palpation a clinically significant pelvic fracture. So the idea of palpation of the pelvis, we do it all the time. That's part of our primary assessment, uh, but palpating the pelvis is not enough. If they've got a super high mechanism, they got walloped by a car or something like that, uh, and they have that low blood pressure, you can't figure out where they're bleeding, putting a pelvic binder on is a really good, uh, is a really good start. Key thing with pelvic binders is we gotta remember that we are uh, centering it on the trochanters of the hips. So it should be that lateral process where that hip bone pops out and not on the uh, iliac crests. So when we go up kind of high, we should be thinking that's too high. It should be down uh, a little bit lower at the basically the top of the thigh. And then ultimately early activation of aviation uh, is really important. So uh, we are, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our logistics, about how long it takes us to get out the door and get on scene to you. But the time to activate aviation for this call is about 10 minutes prior to you making patient contact. That would be the ideal time. Um, so if there's any way that you make that happen, we'll talk about it a little bit. But getting us in route early gives us that time. Um, we have some jurisdictions that pretty religiously put us on standby, and I will say that you never put a rescue truck on standby, right? If you get dispatched to a call and they say the patient might be trapped, you call, you call for a rescue box, you call for the resources you think you're going to need, and you get them moving. If you arrive on scene, find out you don't need them, all right, cancel and put them back in service. Uh, cancellations are free. We don't have an issue with it, right? Uh, if you get us going, uh, we get early activations from jurisdictions pretty regularly. If we get an early activation, we start pulling the aircraft out, and then we get a call back and say, hey, cancel, they're okay, or cancel, they're priority four. Whatever happens, it's no big deal. We'll put the aircraft back. We wait for the next call. So uh, you get this patient out. You've done your external, uh, you've done your hemorrhage control. So you've placed your pelvic binder. You've placed your tourniquets. Uh, you've done a wound packing if necessary. So you've got all the external hemorrhage uh, control that you can do. You've maximized their oxygenation, so you put them on some supplemental oxygen if they're less than 94%, uh, and you've gotten, let's just say, uh, a, a, an IV line. So you've done all the initial care that you think uh, is necessary, and here's the initial set of vital signs. So we've got a heart rate of 130, a blood pressure of 84 over 40, end tidal of 22, SpO2 92, and a GCS of 14. Let's talk about some things that are going to trigger us to transfuse whole blood. So primary triggers that we're looking at in protocol is mechanism of injury uh, or illness. So this is your gunshot wounds, your stabs, your major multi-system trauma. It's going to be a major non-compressible hemorrhage, right? Uh, so I, I had a case uh, right after we got whole blood where I got a guy who um, got his arm trapped underneath a vehicle. 
uh, he was had severe hemorrhage, but it was severe hemorrhage isolated to the to the arm, and we were able to control it, put a tourniquet on. In that case, he had a couple soft pressures, but in that in that case, we've got the hemorrhage controlled. We're not losing any additional blood. He's not likely to take additional, uh, you know, like significant additional surgeries, things like that, right? He's not. We're not going to have to be going to find his bleeding while he's still bleeding out. We know where it is. It's an isolated injury. In that case, I'm less likely to uh, to need to need the transfusion. So it's just one of those things you got to put it in the totality of the circumstances uh, of what's going on. Paired with our mechanism of injury, so the mechanism of injury is one of our components. The next component is going to be the clinical assessment. So you're looking at your level of consciousness. Are they anxious? What do their peripheral pulses look and feel like? Or sorry, if you're looking at it, you probably need to put a tourniquet on it. Um, but what do their peripheral pulses feel like? Uh, what's their blood pressure? Uh, and then shock index. Shock index, we'll talk about it towards the end, but shock index is now one of the trauma decision tree criteria. So if their heart rate's higher than their systolic blood pressure, that's, a, uh, that's an indicator. Uh, if you're one of the systems that has ultrasound, uh, a fast exam, a positive fast exam is also really important. If you've got that fingertip, fingertip lactometer uh, that I would love to see, um, if you've got those, uh, those are another thing that uh, can be really useful for determining this. So this is the protocol for the state of Maryland. This is, uh, it's in all your protocol books. This is the same information that we have. So this is exactly what we're using to administer that blood. The cool thing about that is that means that you have the exact decision criteria that we're gonna use to administer the blood in your pocket uh, and available for you, for you to review prior to the call. So a couple of things we're looking at, we've got that mechanism component up top. So clinical suspicion for major blood loss by penetrating trauma, unstable pelvic fractures, uh, major blood loss, things like that. Um, and then signs and symptoms of a massive GI bleed, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Um, and then you're going to look at that significant physiologic compromise. So age-defined tachycardia, right? If you remember those vital signs I gave you, we got checked right there. End title of less than 25, right? Remember our end title can go low if we don't have blood to move around and get carbon dioxide back to the lungs. Um, or if we're not generating any uh, because we're not circulating things appropriately, right? So in title less than 25. If you've got a fast, if you've got a lactate, capillary reperfusion, and then altered mental status, right? We've all seen those patients that have lost a lot of blood and are just loopy because of it, right? We, I think at this point, uh, most of us can uh, see those patients and go, oh, this isn't going to go well. So those patients right there, where they have that altered sensation, and it's not because they're drunk, it's not because they're drugged, it's not because they rang their bell uh, on their head, uh, it's because they're short of blood. And then if you have a witness PA, cardiac arrest. So we'll talk about that a little bit, but uh, please, if we're, if we're coming in and we're coming in to land and your patient goes into cardiac arrest, uh, don't cancel us. We can come down, we'll help you work your PA, cardiac arrest on a trauma patient. Uh, the key thing is we have to be close. If we are 15 minutes out and they go into trauma arrest, all right, probably not going to be able to help you there much because the time window for saving that is so short. But if you're outside of Baltimore County, um, you know, we've got some uh, guests tuning in from other jurisdictions. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll meet you at a local receiving facility. So like another hospital. The uh, reason why not for Baltimore County is because most of your hospitals are down in Towson or they're like Northwest Hospital and they don't have helipads. Uh, so it's not something that we can land at. So, uh, but you're looking at like your Queen Anne's ER or something like that. We can sometimes land at those receiving facilities, meet you there, help the hospital staff work their PA arrest. And then if we get ROSC, we can transport that patient. So it's one of those things to consider if the patient codes, please don't cancel us. Let us come in, let us make that call, uh, talk to us on the radio and to kind of tell us where you are, what your plan is. Key thing I also want to point out too is contraindications. So if they are wearing a medical alert tag, we all got to check for these things. If they're wearing a medical alert tag that says they don't want blood, uh, or if they are able to talk and tell you, hey, I don't want blood products. Um, if your jurisdiction has uh, uh, like uh, religious pockets or things like that, where you know that they might not want those blood products, that's one of those things to consider. Uh, if you identify those patients, ask them, talk about that, you might have the best opportunity to talk to them if they might potentially go unconscious later. Um, so it's important for, for you guys to try and assess that. But I think probably the biggest thing with all this is you have all the same decision-making criteria that we do. So let us know on the radio. When we call you and we say, hey, can you give me a patient update? Let us know, hey, uh, our patient meets the criteria for blood transfusion. 
right? Give us that quick GCS, airway status, quick set of vitals, and hey, they're a blood candidate. Um, that lets us know to bring the equipment with us to the ambulance. We need two bags uh, of extra equipment. Uh, we need the blood itself and then in a bag that carries our blood warmer and other equipment that I'm going to review a little bit later. But we don't, we're not going to bring that to every single patient. We're only going to bring it to patients where we have the clinical significant or clinical suspicion beforehand uh, that we're going to need it. Other than that, we're just going to grab the patient and go back to the aircraft and we'll set it up in flight. That was actually the last transfusion that I did. Um, so if you know it ahead of time, let us know so we can bring it to the side, patient side. Talk about some of the logistics that we need to transfuse blood. So we want a large bore IV. Uh, preferably two. That would be fantastic, and we'll talk about why in the next slide, but we'd like preferably two. Uh, we don't have a minimum, so we can give uh, blood to, uh, like down like for pediatrics down through like a 22 or 24 gauge IV. It's just going to go very, very slow, and in this case, they've lost a lot of blood quickly. We want to put a lot of blood quickly back, um, so we want greater than or equal to 18. Um, we can give blood via IO, so if the blood comes up and it is, uh, if, if you can't get a line and all you've got is an IO, good enough, right? We can give an, a blood through an IO. Now you will get faster flow rates from an 18 gauge IV, IO than you will from a, uh, uh, a, sorry, 18 gauge IV than you will from an IO. Um, so talking about flow rates and all the things, uh, right? There's a lot of different th elements to go into that, but we would prefer an IV, but an IO is great if that's what you got. Um, we also are starting to carry, just so for everybody's awareness, we're starting to carry again the 12-gauge uh, uh, IV kits. Uh, they are peripheral IVs. They're uh, just a very large bore IV kit. They're specifically for ma massive transfusion of blood products. Um, so you probably won't see that happen much, but uh, we are starting to carry them again. They require a slightly different procedure to, uh, to put in, um, but it's, uh, it's nothing crazy, just another peripheral line, just a much, much larger one. And ideally, we'd like to connect our blood tubing directly to the IV uh, to the IV cath. So blood tubing is larger in diameter than standard IV tubing, right? Uh, because of the filter and all the other things. So the tubing diameter is larger. So if we connect it to a standard extension set or a standard IV line like the piggyback, we're going to get a significant reduction of flow. This is just kind of like your fire hose sizes, right? You want a three or five inch flow, uh, fire hose to flow a large amount of water in a short period of time. It's no different. We want a large bore IV and a large bore uh, I, IV line. Um, so if it's feasible to do so, uh, don't over tape the line because what we might do is disconnect your extension set or your IV. Not that we don't want you to start an IV. We want that IV. Uh, we're just going to try, if we can, to put it direct to the uh, to the hub of the IV. That being said, if it's not possible, it's not possible. You got to do what you got to do. Tape that IV down so that we have it. I much prefer that over anything else. Most common question that we've gotten, I think the question that everybody is here to here to ask is, what about TXA? So any patient that is going to be receiving blood is also a candidate for TXA. Uh, those patients definitely need it, uh, and we definitely, they're going to be, they're going to derive a clinical benefit. The only restriction that we have with giving TXA is that we cannot give it through the same IV line as the blood. So we can give it before the blood. So if you get, if you have a second while you're waiting for us to show up, you can hang the TXA and get it in there. Uh, if we give the blood and then afterwards we can hang the TXA through the same line, that's fine. And if we've got those two large bore IVs, we can put TXA on one arm, blood on the other. All those are fine, right? So the only restriction is we just can't put the TXA through the same IV line as the blood. So talking a little bit about our particular blood and what we're carrying, right? There's a lot of different protocols out there. What we're actually carrying is going to be low titer O positive whole blood. Uh, again, go back, uh, watch Dr. Sikorsky's lecture. Uh, he did a fantastic job of explaining all of those things and all the research behind it. Uh, we've actually, uh, the command all did the Thor network training as well uh, a couple of years ago when we were first looking into this. Um, so he's on to, he's got some great information there. Um, so if you really want to deep dive into the physiology, that's where to get it. Uh, but we are looking at O titer, uh, sorry, low titer O positive whole blood. So it's going to be uh, blood from volunteer donors. 
it's going to be pre-selected to have a low levels of antibodies, which means it has a lower risk of causing any sort of transfusion reactions. The white blood cells are filtered out because we don't want any sort of immune, uh, immunity reactions or anything like that, uh, or uh, uh, any, any additional reactions. And then you have a uh, citrate, foxtrate, phosphate, and dextrose CPD uh, additive added as a preservative. Um, our blood in this case uh, can be cold stored for 21 days. We have it for the first seven. So some programs have their blood for 14 or for longer days. We have it for seven. Uh, maybe that'll change as, as we get more experience with the program, but for now we're taking it for the first seven days. After that first seven days, it's rotated back into the shock trauma TRU. Uh, the reason is right where we're, we have a partnership with the University of Maryland Blood Bank to get our blood. So we're holding on to it for the first couple of days and then we give it back to them and they're going to use it. Um, ideally, also, as long as they have a unit to give us, we will restock there. So if they if we go to any Baltimore hospital, we can hop over to shock trauma, get a new uh, get a new unit of blood to hopefully keep us exactly one to one. There may be cases where like if one of our aircraft goes to a different hospital in a completely different city, so like Trooper 5, if they go out to West Virginia to Ruby or something like that, they may not be able to get blood immediately right back. Um, so hopefully, addition, uh, you know, in a perfect world, when the system's all fleshed out, we'll have two units. And if they only give one, they'll have another one on board. But otherwise, we're going to have to get them uh, restocked via another means. Uh, that other means is probably going to be me and somebody else, right? Uh, all of us admin staff uh, hustling on cars and driving all over the place. Uh, but that's okay. Um, so in the time that it takes us to drive another unit out there from Baltimore out to Cumberland, if they get another call, they may not have it. Um, so we'll talk about this a little bit when we get into logistics and timing, but uh, you know, there, there might be cases where we don't have the blood on board. Should be a very rare occurrence now, uh, now that we have all aircraft set up on it. And as the program expands, it should get uh, more and more rare. Uh, but for this early, early couple months, it, it may happen. Um, so uh, a couple questions. Uh, so we put on. So these questions are actually designed for uh, for public consumption. We put a wristband on every single patient that we give whole blood to that has a QR code that goes to a couple of these questions here. Uh, has a website on the MIMS the uh, MIMS website that lets us lets people know um, either receiving hospital staff or the patient patient family. They can scan this and go, hey, uh, the, this wristband from the state police says that they got whole blood. Uh, what's going on? So they can uh, see some of these questions like, why are we not using uh, O negative blood? Uh, and the short and the simple answer is the supply versus demand. We just don't have enough O negative blood to do this sort of program with specifically O negative blood. Uh, there's only about 7% of the US population, which is O negative and compared to about 40%, which is O positive. Um, so we just have a lot more O positive blood available to us. Is it safe to give RH positive blood to people who are RH negative? Uh, so there is a risk of trans transfusion reactions. However, uh, the risk is particularly low. Uh, our protocol is designed for a patient that is in profound shock by the time we are actually administering blood. So those patients a lot of times are not able to mount a transfusion reaction uh, to that RH factor. And, and also that sensitization, sensitization takes time. Uh, up to a, a week, maybe more, to actually build up. So they have to survive the initial trauma first, uh, and that's a and that's a higher risk. There is also there are some medications. There's like Rogam, for example. There's other medications out there uh, that can potentially negate some of that stuff. Uh, so the the kind of risk benefit calculus is they have to survive the immediate injury, um, and that's and that's kind of where we're at with that. And then also the risk is very low uh, going forward. Similar risk uh, or similar answer for the risk of women with childbearing age. Uh, they, uh, there is a risk with uh, giving O positive blood to a woman of childbearing age that her fetus at some point, uh, if she has a, um, if she has a child with a different blood type, uh, they may have a, uh, a complication with that pregnancy. Uh, but the risk is very low and the risk of dying of the immediate trauma that we're trying to fix with the whole blood is significantly higher. Um, and so that's ultimately what's led us, and not just us. I mean, we are uh, a late adopter, to, so to speak, of a lot of this. Uh, but there, uh, there are a lot of systems out there using the same logic and using the same uh, kind of calculus to determine that giving O positive whole blood is safe uh, for uh, for everybody. Um, 
and also notably too, when we deliver you to shock trauma TRU, they're also using the same whole uh, O positive whole blood. Now they have the blood bank, and so they have the option to draw some additional ones, but they're at least starting out with the same uh, same medic or same blood that we have. So ultimately, with all this, uh, right, the risk uh, and the benefit calculation, right, uh, the benefit is going to outweigh the risk. Uh, there is some there is some risk of like a anaphylaxis or uh, a other transfusion reaction. We have the uh, right, it lays out in the protocol the response to that, and we also have the medications that we carry, uh, like the um, the Dax and the Benadryl. Like we have that exactly right with the blood too, so it's it's all readily available in the rare occurrence that we have a tra uh, transfusion reaction. But the idea here is that this is a uh, deployable product that we can bring to the patient's uh, bedside at injury. Uh, and get it immediately transfusing. Um, so it's a quick and, uh, and really uh, effective intervention. So some of the equipment that we're going to use. Uh, so you'll see us this tan cooler on the left. Uh, that is our uh, that is actually our blood. Uh, that's what it would carry in it. It has a uh, thermal isolation container inside of it that is a basically like a, a like a igloo ice pack that is a complete box and that is frozen. We change that out every 24 hours. Uh, the middle box in the bottom with the little battery indicator on it, that is our blood warmer. So blood and or IV fluids, we have a small cartridge. The IV line plugs into one side. You'll be able to run uh, the IV fluid through a coil, and then it comes out the other side. Uh, it will go in at the blood's temperature of about five degrees Celsius and come out at body temperature. Um, so it, uh, it's a very effective uh, system. Uh, we've also used it for non-blood, for just IV fluids on patients who are severely hypothermic. So if you have a severely hypothermic patient, things like that, uh, this also is a is a uh, a warming device that we can use for uh, active internal rewarming. Um, that life flow gun right there. Uh, so to give to to give blood to pediatrics, and we can give blood to kids all the way down to one years old uh, without giving uh, without medical control. At below one year old, we need medical control for it just because of the the age of the kid and all the other things. Um, but uh, one of the key components of that is in order to give blood to kids, we have to very precisely measure how much we're giving. So we're giving, uh, we're giving that 10 cc's per kilo. Well, every squeeze of that handle is 10 cc's. So this is one of those ways that allows us to rapidly infuse and measure the amount of blood that we're giving through that device. Um, then uh, down here on the bottom here, uh, that is a, just an idea of like a slightly, uh, slightly uh, a chunk of the blood tubing. Blood tubing is uh, larger in diameter, like I mentioned earlier, and it's split into a Y. So that Y is going to have the unit of blood hanging on a pressure bag and then a saline bag on the other side. That saline is just for uh, flushing the line. That's pretty much it. It's a small 250 cc bag just for flushing the line, and then we have the blood on the other side. Um, but that filter is designed to catch any sort of clots or anything like that that may have formed in the bag. Um, uh, during the during storage. So we'll talk about when to call. Uh, early activation is absolute key. So we take about 10 minutes from the time our phone rings to the time we are wheels up and off the airport. Uh, we are very fast once we're in the air, and we'll talk and I'll show you some slides that demonstrate that. But the big launch delay, the big lag in us, is actually getting out of the airport and off, or like out of the hangar and off the ground. Uh, we've tried a bunch of different things. We've tried leaving aircraft outside, things like that. It tends to increase the amount of maintenance faults and things like, ha like that, and that results in more delays. So what we do is when the phone rings, we take our aircraft out, we start it up, and we go. And that whole process takes about 10 minutes. Um, this is another reason why it's really important uh, not to put us on standby. We are always on standby. Uh, we are just like a fire truck. A fire truck's always on standby. You don't put a fire truck on standby. You just roll it, uh, and we are no different. Get us going, get us launched, uh, and early as possible. When we get up and we're in flight, if we check in on you uh, with on the radio, we say, hey, we're up on the talk group, and they say, hey, uh, this isn't actually as bad as it sounded, uh, you guys can cancel. Cool, no problem, we'll go back to base. Um, and it's kind of important, right? The EMS protocols will spell out exactly when a patient can be transported, not necessarily when patients, when e uh, aviation can be activated. So this is one of those things. If you launch us for this incident, and then let's just say it's 20 minutes from the hospital, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of break down a lot of these times here in a minute, but let's just say it's pretty close. Well, if you've got that Alpha or Bravo patient, even though it's relatively close to the hospital, we can still be effective. 
If it's a Charlie Delta patient, then that's actually not in protocol for us to fly if you're within 30 minute drive to a trauma center. But that comes in when we actually start discussing the transport. Uh, if nobody's made it to the scene yet and you don't have a category and priority, you can still launch the aviation asset as a early activation. So the biggest thing is you just say, hey, it's an early activation. You can do that based on the dispatch notes. That allows us to do that 10 minute startup window while you're still driving to the scene. And then we're in the air, we're moving towards you and that, that speeds up that whole process. I'll demonstrate that a little bit more. But the key thing is we wanna get a meaningful intervention on board to the patient. So that meaningful intervention, blood, uh, airway management in, in, the, in the case of a closed head injury, that meaningful intervention allows time, the time of decompensation of that patient to pause. It's not a stop, right? Because what they need is that definitive care. They need the bright lights and cold steel but it does put pause on things and gives it buys us a little bit more time. So let's talk about the scenario. Uh, I picked an intersection that would be kind of close to Pikesville's area uh, that would also fit my needs. This is a carefully crafted uh, intersection, but uh, it's one that we, uh, a lot of us are probably familiar with. Uh, this is Park Heights and Green Spring Valley Road. So uh, it's dispatched at this location, uh, that 70 year old female, the one that I've kind of been coming back to, this is taking this a little bit out of order but it's dispatched as a rescue box. So they're saying that she is uh, reported trapped and the bystander is saying that the patient that is trapped is unconscious and not talking. Right there from the initial, as soon as you roll out the station, if those are the notes that you have, you have enough information to launch aviation. Um, so I, I really want that to be clear. You can launch aviation right then and there. You don't have to actually see if their GCS is less than 13. You don't actually have to see if they have more than one long bone fracture. That right there is enough to launch us not to put us put a patient in the helicopter and transport, but it's enough to get us going and moving, which by the time you get to the scene, you should be able to assess and figure out whether or not we're needed. So from that scene, let's look at transport time to trauma centers. So you got down to Sinai, that's your level two center. That looks to be about uh, 15 to 17 minutes. And then down to all the way down to shock trauma, which you'd actually probably stop at Hopkins on the way, but um, all the way down to shock trauma is 27 minutes. So you're pretty close to the hospitals. So in your Charlie and Delta patients, you don't particularly need aviation resources. Those patients have a little bit more time. They're not as critical. But one of the things that I want to point out here is the difference between uh, our flight, our transport time, and the transport time by ground. So if we were gonna, if we were to go to Sinai from the scene, that is a two and a half minute flight. If we were to able to go to shock trauma, it's a five minute flight. Uh, we don't stop for intersections, we blow right, right through them, uh, and we go up to 170 miles an hour in a straight line if we can get up to speed. So we have a significant amount of speed. The biggest thing is getting us started early enough for us to be there when you need us. So some factors to consider with all this is the weather, uh, right? We'll talk a little bit about weather in, my, uh, in the next little portion of this, but uh, that's going to that's gonna play a factor in this. Uh, traffic time of day. If you know that this is five o'clock traffic and you're not going to be able to make those ideal times, then then the uh, uh, the reasoning kind of shifts, right? Uh, is the patient trapped? If the patient's going to be trapped for a significant amount of time, let's think if the patient's trapped and I can land this aircraft next to the scene, now I can help you during the extrication. We might be able to start blood during the extrication. Um, and then instead of anything else, we put that patient directly from the extrication unit into the helicopter. And then we have that five minute transport down to the primary adult resource center, right? So we have that option to really uh, get that patient to a definitive care pretty, pretty fast. Um, I've worked in Baltimore County before. I was about, uh, I've rode on Medic 325 a whole bunch. I know that there are plenty of times where there is not a transport unit anywhere close. So if you're on that engine company, if you're on that first responder, if you're coming from a ways, you know, if you're going from medic eight to this intersection for this call, you're like, hey, start aviation because it's going to be a minute anyways. We might get the aircraft there. It's might, well, it might all work out. If you don't start us until you get to the scene, you delay us by that or you delay the whole process by that much more. So it doesn't hurt. Uh, early calls are free uh, and, and cancellations are free. If you turned out to not need us, then call and cancel. It's not a big deal. But the biggest thing is what the patient needs. So let's talk about a little bit about the timeline of this injury. So the time starts when the patient gets injured, right? We've got time for the 911 call. We've got time for the intake. We've got time, right? So the, these are all rough times, right? This is back of the napkin math. Um, 
but the time ends not when they arrive at the hospital, right? Because if they when they arrive at the hospital, there's still some things that need to get done, but they it really ends with definitive care. So let's just say two minutes into this incident, you got fire department units coming. Eight minutes, so you got about a five minute in route time, you get initial units to arrive. And two minutes later, after you make patient contact, you're like, oh man, we need aviation. So you get us requested. We, our goal, our stated goal throughout the entire state is to have an aircraft at a patient side within 20 minutes of call. So that's our, that's the goal that I'm using here. Uh, there's a lot of factors that are going to go into that, whether or not you're getting the first due aircraft or the second due aircraft or anything like that. But that's our goal. So that's the, that's the number that we're going to use. So 20 minutes. And it takes about five minutes for us to set up. Um, it, and that's to do our, you know, put on our monitor, do our initial assessment, and then actually get the blood set up and transfuse. So let's just say, cool, uh, 35 minutes post-injury, we're setting up, we're, we're transfusing blood. That's great, right? Uh, we transport a couple minutes later, and then 50 minutes in here, uh, we're now arriving at the trauma center. But the cool thing about this is we press that pause button, right? We got the transfusion started early. So the flip side is if you activate us early, we push all of this up by however many minutes it takes, however many minutes you shave off of that activation. So if you activate us five minutes earlier, you get blood on the board on board with the patient five minutes early. So it's just important, right? This the whole thing is just designed. This will shift that timeline of what that patient needs earlier and earlier and in, into the incident. So the bottom line of all this is that uh, for us in the, in the aviation command, right, we do primarily trauma patients and blood is a huge deal for us, right? This is a, this has been an absolute, this is going to be an absolute game changer. It's fantastic to be able to bring this resource to our patients. Um, I have watched, right, plenty of times since, since we started discussing blood a couple of years ago, I've sat in the back of the aircraft with patients and I'm like, man, this patient needs blood and I can't give it to them because I don't have it. Now I've got it and I'm super excited. Um, but, and, and all of us are, when we're really excited to get out here and, and serve and, and help these patients. So we wanna get out there and help you. And the best way that we can help you is if we're activated early and we're in on the incident early. So the other thing too, is how can you help this blood program? If you're, if you're uh, interested in that, and the biggest one there is donate blood. Everything about our program is set up based on uh, the availability of the resource. So, you know, one of the issues and one of the reasons it took us so long to get blood on board is there wasn't whole, like people were making one to one to one. Nobody was making whole blood in the state of Maryland for a while. So you know, it's, it's things like that. This is now, uh, whole blood is now being made. It's now being processed and, and transferred to us. Uh, but there's a finite amount and that amount has to go to the hospitals. It has to go to more than one just hospital. So if you're eligible, get out there and donate blood. Uh, we'll probably start putting and, and try and put out cooperative stuff for uh, how to host blood drives and things like that. But for now, any blood into the system, uh, anywhere in the Red Cross system, right? The Red Cross is who it ultimately supplies ours. I think they're the only ones that really hold host blood drives within the state of Maryland. Um, but Anova, Fairfax, and Northern Virginia, if you're if I'm if I'm my voice is going that far, wherever you have the opportunity to do so, donate blood. Um, it is a precious resource, whether it goes to our aircraft, whether it goes to any other hospital, whether it goes to be, be component therapies, it's a precious resource and it's actually super important. So let's talk about the, uh, the thing that I have to talk about every single time, which is LZ safety and setup. Um, and this is really important for EMS providers to, to consider, right? The, the guy that I had whose arm was crushed, uh, I, gotta, I don't know if you're, if you're out there, but there's a Carol medic that uh, made a good request for aviation to transport a patient down to the hand center uh, for this crushed hand. Um, and she was expecting about a 20 minute ETA. Well, we were uh, up on a training flight. And so the ETA that we came back and gave her was four minutes, uh, which is another thing. If you don't call us, you don't know, right? A lot of times we go up on training flights, we go up from other missions, we're leaving the hospitals, we're doing whatever things. So you're uh, response time for an ETA might be four minutes. Uh, in that case, there was not time for the engine to show up. Uh, and so uh, they were able to, they did a fantastic job. They come up, talked to us on the radio. They got us set up for a landing zone and we landed right in the guy's backyard. Um, so this is important for everybody to understand uh, and know the, the kind of core things that we need. So ultimately the crew will make decision where to land. And a lot of times if this, if it's a situation like that, we can kind of pick our own landing zone. We got to find where you are, and then we'll pick a suitable field in, in there and around the immediate vicinity. And if we got to go around, try it once or twice, we can. It's not a big deal. There's four of us on board. 
Uh, we're all trained professionals. We can make it work. Um, but ultimately, you're going to pick a landing zone, and we're going to decide whether or not we put our, uh, our aircraft in it. Um, if you're talking to us and trying to reference us, you're going to use the clock positions. So 12 o'clock is off the nose of the aircraft. 6 o'clock is the tail of the aircraft. 3 is the right. 9 is the left. Biggest thing, if you're trying to set up a landing zone, you want to stand in the middle of that landing zone and you want to make sure the ground is hard and firm, right? If you feel like your ambulance or your pickup truck or your engine would get stuck going into that, going driving onto that grass, then it's too soft for us to land, right? So you want to make sure it's firm ground and then you want to stand up, look around and do a circle. And you're looking for wires, you're looking for poles, you're looking for things that might uh, cause us an issue, particularly at night. If while we're coming in, anything gets uh, unusual, whatever, right? Uh, if we're coming in and we're too close to the rescue scene and we're starting to blow debris on the patient or something like that, if anything goes on, anybody can get on a radio and say, go around. Go arounds are free. Uh, that's the verbiage you just need to do. Anybody can key up a radio, say, go around. Uh, we'll, we'll depart the area and circle and try and figure out what happened. Um, we might, it might be immediately obvious to us. If not, we'll ask and figure out what, what's going on. But that's, uh, it, it's easy to back out of the LZ and, and move on if we need to. Sometimes we'll take a ground provider. Uh, if we do, we're, we're going to kind of uh, pick one and we'll try and bring you back. Uh, our, our GPS coordinate format, and this is important, is degrees, decimal, minutes. There's a lot of other coordinate formats out there. If you give us the wrong format, uh, we might not find the same location. That being said, if you don't know how to find a GPS coordinate, give us a street address. Uh, our syscom can figure it out. Uh, we can figure it out from the air. And then make sure that you're parked in a nice, open, visible area. We'll find you. Uh, so we look for 150 by 150. Uh, we'll talk about this in an upcoming slide, but we can fit into a little bit smaller area, right? Our rotor disc is only about 45 feet across. Uh, we're about so. Honestly, our aircraft can fit in about a 50 by 50 box. That being said, uh, we like to have exits. We like to have uh, you know ways to get out if an engine fails or something like that, which doesn't really happen often. But um, if something happens, we like to be able to have an escape route. So we like a larger landing zone. The largest you can give us is preferred. Um, we want it to be flat. Uh, we don't need a, a very steep slope. If it's a very steep slope, we're going to run into issues about potentially like the aircraft being off balance or people walking into the rotor rotor system if it's on the on the low side. So we need to be relatively fat or sorry flat. And again, it needs to be a firm surface. We love pavement, uh, but a firm surface. Uh, we are about a fifteen thousand pound aircraft, and we sit on four little tiny wheels. So we are going to sink if it's muddy. Um, a little bit of sinking is fine. A lot of sinking is bad. We have some very expensive antennas and a million dollar camera underneath it that we can damage if we sink in. So we don't like to do that. And ideally, particularly if your patient's trapped, we want to land as close as possible to the scene. If we're super close, we can come right there and help you out. Uh, if we're too far away, uh, trying to arrange for a unit like a utility or a police car or somebody to come pick the medics up and bring you to them, uh, bring us to you if it's going to be a prolonged extrication. But if we're too far away, just sitting in a field, we can't help you. So I even found some pictures of the intersection. Let's take a look here. So uh, this is Green Spring Valley. You've got two different rows of uh, views there. One of the things I want to point out is typically a two lane road uh, with a little bit of slop on either side is big enough for us to fit the aircraft. A lot of that's going to depend on wind direction. So potentially in this top image, right where the right past where that uh, black pickup truck is, we could potentially land there. So it doesn't have to be a huge space. Um, and we like to be, again, as close as possible to the incident. Uh, now, the flip side is uh, on the bottom image, if we're going back towards uh, where the double yellow line is, kind of on the opposite side where the, uh, from where the tree truck is, there's trees that are now overhanging that uh, section of roadway. And the wires are a lot closer to the roadway. So we don't particularly like that. However, this is more like what our aerial view is. So if you don't have time to set, if you've early activated us and did the exact things that you want and you don't have time to set up our landing zone, that's fine. This is the aerial perspective that we have and we might be able to find one that makes sense for us and is safe and can just put ourselves down without having to bother you, all right? Uh, obviously the noise, the wind and all the things will bother everybody. Everybody's gonna look, that's just one of those things. Um, but we can potentially find our own landing zone and set ourselves down. 
So this field, for example, right here on this little side street uh, seems to be a perfect location, right? It's not, uh, there's fewer wires, there's a more open space, I've got some more leeway on either side, and it's close enough for me to walk down to the scene. And if I look right there, look, it's nice clean grass. The only thing I got to worry about is if there's dogs or horses or whatever in this field or if that gate's locked. But these are all things that I can that I can figure out, right? The flight crews can be pretty autonomous if you activate us early enough and you're worried about like, ah, I won't have everything set up. I won't have an LZ engine. I won't have this. I won't have that. Those are all very nice to have, but we can make it work. Get us that early activation started uh, and communicate with us over the radio whether or not we need us on the ground or whether or not we can orbit and wait for that LZ engine, whatever works out, right? Key thing, uh, if I haven't said it, about, if I haven't said it before, is to get us started early. Uh, approaching the aircraft. Uh, so when we're on the ground, LZ security is a priority. Uh, if we're landing on a major roadway like 695, uh, traffic's going to have to be stopped down and stopped in both directions and like really well stopped because people will drive around all sorts of barriers and try and drive under a helicopter because they're errand is more important than whatever's going on. Um, but uh, so LZ safety is really important and uh, we want both sides of the, of the road shut down. Um, make sure you remove any hats or loose clothing or anything like that, anything that might blow away. Uh, the stretcher sheet is one of them that sometimes blows away. So trying to remove any of that stuff. Don't raise anything over your head. So you don't need to be holding IV bags up ahead. At the same time, I also don't need everybody ducking, right? You don't have to duck and crouch to come into our aircraft. Our rotor disc is pretty high up. Uh, so you don't have to duck. You can just walk normally. That's fine. And then ultimately follow the directions of the flight crew. So uh, let's talk a little bit about MCIs, mass casualty incidents. So uh, let's just say in this particular scenario, you have the same incident location, but you have uh, the proverbial uh, bus full of nuns, right? You have a bus full of people and you've got a lot of patients. Uh, maybe some of them are burned. Maybe some of them are pediatric you are very quickly going to overload the immediate trauma resources of the Baltimore area if you have enough patients. So one of the things that we can help you is that we can get up to four aircraft to a scene in about 30 minutes, particularly in the central location of the state. You're looking at Trooper 1, Trooper 3, Trooper 2, and Trooper 6, all within about 30 minutes ETA to your location. So that gives us an option to spread out patients throughout the, throughout the whole region. So for example, from that scene to MedStar or Children's National is a 15 minute flight for us. So that 15 minute transport that got you at Sinai, we're now at a hospital in DC. So that's one of those things that if you call us to activate that MCI, get those additional resources coming, call for two, three aircraft, we can get you and get your patients up distributed, particularly in a thing where you have like multiple burns, uh, right? Bayview is only gonna take so many burn patients uh, we can spread that out. We can get you from somewhere in the Baltimore area down to MedStar, 15 minutes, right? Um, so that's one of those things to consider, even in places where you don't uh, typically, uh, where you wouldn't typically need it. And then Christiana Hospital, that's another uh, level one trauma center in, De in Delaware. There's a children's hospital, AI DuPont, uh, I think they changed their name, uh, right next to it. So that's a 24 minute flight, a little bit longer, but uh, we've got blood, we've got uh, RSI, we've got a lot of medications, a lot of sedatives, a lot of pain medicines. We've got all the things that we can take care of that patient for that 24 minutes. Biggest thing we need from you in a mass casualty incident is to try and bring as best as possible all the patients that you want transported by air to one landing zone. When patients get transported to multiple landing zones, it gets really complex. Uh, so we like everybody to come to one landing zone. If possible, if not, we'll adjust, we'll make it work. Our default mode when we, when we show up is we're gonna be the first in, last out. So our first aircraft there is gonna assist the triage officer and that flight crew is gonna go through and triage all the patients that you have at the landing zone, determine who's gonna need what. We might start some interventions early, but then we're going to pass additional aircraft, uh, additional aircraft uh, those patients as they arrive. So let's just say Trooper 1 lands in this landing zone as Trooper 2 shows up, as soon as they show up, they're going to get a report directly from Trooper 1's crew. Here, take this patient, go here. Hand the patient, and then Trooper 2 departs. And then the same thing with Trooper 3, Trooper 6, and whoever else is coming. Um, one of the other things to consider is, you know, I talked about that flight time down to shock trauma is about five minutes. So we might be able to go drop off a patient at shock trauma and then turn right back around and come back to your scene and pick up multiple. So we might be able to shuttle. Key thing again, as always, is get us involved early. Uh, that'll be the best thing to do. Um, ultimately, this whole first in, last out is a little bit situation dependent. 
if there is only one landing zone and it is only big enough for one aircraft, then we're going to take the highest priority patient with the first aircraft and leave. But ultimately, the flight crew will kind of make that adjustment as necessary. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about weather capabilities. So uh, this is us flying in some pretty nasty weather right there. Uh, we have, over the past uh, couple months to a year, uh, uh, dramatically increased our ability to fly in inclement weather. So we are uh, expanding our usage of the instrument flight rules. Now, this is a safe and effective practice. This is something that uh, the FAA says is safe, everybody else says, right? And we are actually in one of the safest aircraft to do it in. And with our two pilot system, uh, we are very well equipped to take this sort of mission. Uh, matter of fact, today, Trooper 7 did one uh, from St. Mary's, went to Charles County, and then back to shock trauma with a patient that we would not have been able to take about a year ago. Uh, just due to our own policies. So this is a fantastic expansion of our capabilities. Now, unfortunately, we'll talk about it a little bit, but it doesn't help Baltimore County as much, but we'll talk about where some things where it can help, be helpful. Um, for the record, IFR flight, like I said, it's very safe. Uh, anytime you fly on a commercial airliner, they are using instrument flight rules, regardless of whether or not it's clear, bright, sunny, and they can see where they're going. They're still on those flight paths. They're still talking to air traffic control. That's the thing that makes IFR flight very safe is that it is very tightly controlled. We're always talking to a controller. They're, they have us on radar and they're watching us do everything. And then we use our autopilots. So to give you an idea, uh, our uh, visual flight rules are three miles of hor uh, horizontal visibility. So we need to be able to see three miles ahead of us and we need a thousand feet from the ground to the ceiling or to the, to the bottom of the clouds. Our old rules were, uh, for an IFR flight, we needed 802. So we only had a little bit of space where we could actually take that IFR mission. New rules uh, is now that we are, uh, we have different minimums for actually taking off and planning the mission versus executing the mission. And that's also important. So taking off, we need 200 uh, feet above the published approach minimum. And I'm gonna show you one here in a minute and show you what it looks like. And then one mile of visibility above the published approach minimum. And once in flight, we can use the published approach minimum. So we can go down to the minimum altitude that the FAA says is safe. That's important because this allows us to depart from the airport. For, so for example, Trooper 1 is based at Martin State Airport. There's sometimes, because of the uh, water near us, there's sometimes low level fog or low level clouds in and around this coastal area where we're at. So what we might be able to do is pick up and lift out of Martin State under IFR and then break out into a clearer, uh, clearer area and actually reach your scene. The reason why I say this doesn't help Baltimore County as much is that there aren't that many instrument approaches in Baltimore County outside of shock trauma and Martin State. Uh, we need to be able to go to a place that has a defined instrument approach. And what that looks like is this. So this is part of the instrument approach to shock trauma. Basically, this is a series of GPS breadcrumbs that our helicopter can follow to get us all the way down to this last point here called Zenig. These are just names that they pulled out of a hat. Um, but at that point Zenig, uh, we can see whether or not we see the hospital. If we see the hospital, we need to be, uh, we can come down to as low as 344 feet off the ground and three quarter mile of visibility. So it's about where the Baltimore train museum is. From that, you can go uh, straight in. I see somebody asked if Westminster Airport supports IFR landings, and yes, they do. So a lot of your airports will, uh, and we'll, we're going to get to some of those things uh, in a couple of slides. But so this means that now we can get into shock trauma. If we are out and we're taking a mission, we can arrive at shock trauma with 340 or 350 or 400 foot ceilings and about a mile of horizontal visibility. So prior to launch, we need that buffer, 602. The real reason for that buffer isn't safety, it's patient care. It's so that we can guarantee that if we take the mission, we're probably gonna arrive at the intended destination without any go-arounds or missed approaches that would delay patient care. Um, but so we need that little buffer. And then to actually get there, once, we get, once we're in flight, we can use that whole thing. And this is what it looks like. So this is the end of shock trauma's approach in a, on a bad weather day. So we weren't transporting a patient. This was a training flight, but you can kind of see uh, we're looking out. We've got pretty low ceilings. Uh, there's some rain going on. Uh, this is video evidence, by the way. If you ever hear anybody say cloud in the sky, MSP won't fly. Uh, nope, not anymore. Uh, we're uh, happily up there buzzing around in them. Um, 
but uh, looking right ahead, you can kind of see the, uh, the the skyline of the city. That's about where we're at when we uh, when we're able to see what's going on, and uh, we can actually see the hospital from there, and we can continue down. So the key takeaway is that they require additional planning, right? Uh, we have additional fuel minimums. We have additional things that, that are requirements. Like for example, Trooper 7 to take their mission today had to add fuel above what we usually know, uh, have in order to have enough uh, of, a, uh, of a reserve. Um, so the launch is gonna be delayed. Uh, the en route time might be a little longer because we can't necessarily go straight there. Um, and then we being, again, we might not be able to take a direct route. We have to hit a certain GPS point in the sky to enter that approach pattern. And so, for example, if we're coming from the south, uh, we kind of have to go up a little bit north over like I uh, over uh, almost by a security square to catch the instrument approach to get us down into Baltimore. Um, so it's just one of those things uh, where we've got a, a little bit of variance in there. We're also limited. We can't usually make it to a scene with uh, under IFR conditions. These GPS approaches have to be built out. Now, that's one of those things where we can partner with some fire departments and we're talking, we're in talks with some around the state in certain places to build GPS approaches to a firehouse that has a landing zone. So if your firehouse has a helipad and you're in like some place that doesn't have an instrument approach nearby, we can talk about building an approach to you so we can get there. Um, but again, make the request early. And what we can do is we'll tell you, we'll come back and tell you, hey, uh, we'll be able to get to Westminster Airport, for example, in 30 minutes. And then it's up to you and the ground medic to determine whether or not that is appropriate for your patient. So like I said, we're gonna be trying to build out this system to try and expand the amount of places that we can get to. So we can build the GPS approach uh, to anything. Uh, this is known as point in space approaches. So like a shock trauma approach is, or the approach to shock trauma is a point in space approach. It just takes you to this little spot. Uh, we can build that to a firehouse. Um, so we're in talks right now with like Garrett County, for example, and then Ocean City Fire Department. We're talking a little bit with them about building a uh, IFR approach into Ocean City. They have a lot of calls that need us and there's not another way to get out there. Uh, if the weather's bad, so we're building a, you know, we're working on them and cooperating with them to build an IFR approach. So if you're in the uh, decision-making tree and that's something that you want at your department, uh, reach out to us. We'll support you. We'll talk about uh, how, what you need and what sort of things will make sense. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the other missions that we do that aren't medevac. This is a cool picture from earlier in the year. This is us hoisting a patient from this uh, Carnival cruise ship. I believe this was the Carnival Legend, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, somebody had a medical emergency leaving the Port of Baltimore on their cruise, and uh, their cruise got cut short uh, by a, a brief ride up our hoist and into our aircraft and then back over to, uh, I believe, Cap Region is where we ended up taking that one. Um, so uh, an option, and we have a lot of very wide and diverse missions. So again, if you get us going early, uh, we can help you locate a patient or give you that eye in the sky perspective. So let's just say you've got a hunter that calls in with an actual accidental gunshot wound and they like, ah, man, I'm at a tree stand, but I don't know exactly where I am. I think I came in off of this road. If it sounds bad, let's just say he shot above his knee, right? That's already a Bravo category. If it sounds bad, you can go ahead and launch us for that early activation. We can help you find the patient. If we find the patient and nobody's there with them, we have two paramedics on board. Both of them are hoist qualified. We can put a paramedic right next to that patient to do the immediate care and maybe just lift him out and go. Um, we are capable of doing that. We do that sometimes out in the mountains in Western Maryland. Um, <clears throat> but that, that is one of those uh, options that we offer. We can search large areas rapidly. So if you've got a large uh, area to search, uh, for like a water incident or something like that, we can cover a lot of ground for you. Um, and then on large incidents, uh, uh, we can come up and help the guide the command team. So we can give you like on a, a large like woods fire or brush fire, we can give you an idea of like, hey, uh, here's some things over here. Here's some things over here. You might need a team to go over here. We can't drop water. Uh, we, we got asked that a bunch by uh, recently, but uh, we can get up there and help you guys out on the command and control side. Uh, the biggest of one of our kind of non-traditional missions is aerial rescue. So uh, we are pro, uh, set up and capable of uh, lifting a patient right out of whatever situation they're in. Um, so we can insert one of our paramedics and remove that patient from whatever situation. Uh, we are capable of transitioning directly into a medevac. So basically, as soon as we lift that patient up back to the aircraft, we close that cabin door and we start flying away. We are now en route to the hospital. 
There's no other transfer. There's no landing. There's no handing that patient off to an ambulance. We are uh, an ambulance just like you guys. And so as soon as we're at the top, we're gone. Um, this can cut a significant amount of time, right? We've seen incidents around the states where we have these uh, very uh, these critical, critically injured patients that are taking these long falls off of cliffs and things like that, where they have pelvic fractures, multiple long bone fractures. They might need that blood that, I've, that we've got now. Um, but instead what they do is they do a very long, low angle rope evacuation, takes about 30, 40 minutes. They get them to the top of the hill, they get them put up into an ambulance and they drive that patient over to a landing zone and hand them to us. We can cut about an hour off that whole process uh, and it's safe and effective to do so. So uh, we can do it. Um, that's one of those things that if the patient's fine, right? If you can walk them out, walk them out, not a big deal. But if the patient's critically injured and you can get them to a hospital faster by using us for the service, please do. We've done them in all sorts of places. We've even done a, we even did a hoist a couple years ago in Baltimore city, right under the 395 overpass. Uh, if it makes sense, we'll do it. Uh, we are very well equipped. Um, this aircraft, because it has twin engines and uh, numerous redundant systems and a four axis autopilot, along with two pilots on board, uh, we're one of the safest platforms to actually perform that mission. Um, so the big thing here is if you call us early, you've got options. Uh, we've got those, uh, we have that ability to do all this stuff. Um, and it just takes us a little bit of extra time on the beginning to like rig, put on harnesses and do the things that we would, order, uh, that we would do for mission planning to get out the door for a hoist. So if you call us early, uh, we get involved, we'll be able to help you out. Uh, if you wait and call us till like very late in the incident, sometimes it can be really difficult, right? Um, Uh, if you're working with us on a site where we're going to hoist, it is very important. If you think that's a possibility, uh, you're, you should have helmet, eye protection, and gloves. Uh, and I would highly recommend ear protection. It is very loud on the ground. Uh, we're a loud aircraft, so highly recommend ear protection. A single dose probably wouldn't be that bad, but um, it, don't, don't mess with your hearing. Um, but helmet, eye protection, and gloves are minimum. Um, if you're going way back in the woods on a thing that might turn into a hoist, might turn into a technical rescue, uh, try and pick the right PPE, right? Uh, come back with a helmet, eye, gloves, as opposed to full bunker gear, right? Uh, just kind of depends on what you need. A couple of devices that we have. So we have a rescue basket, which I didn't really put in this PowerPoint because it's a primarily overwater device and we're just gonna put it down. Uh, it's the same thing you see on any number of Coast Guard shows or whatever, same thing Coast Guard uses. We just put it down, the patient has to crawl in and we lift them up. Uh, but for ambulatory patients over land, we have this air rescue vest, Quick Connect. So you can see there, uh, it's packaged with a helmet for the patient that we can put on them. We can deploy our guy, pick this person back up. Um, I've got a video, I didn't put it in here for the sake of time, but the entire evolution of us putting a paramedic in and then lifting that patient back out, that whole process from start to finish is about 10 minutes. So uh, cuts a lot of time off. Uh, we can do this, right? If, depending on what nece was necessary for your patient, we can use this device. Other device that we have available to us is that is the PET bag. So this is the patient extrication platform. Key thing with this is that we're using a standard backboard. So mobilize your patient to a backboard if they're supine, uh, stand old spider straps, same old everything else. We will use these little pristle groups in the middle to secure the backboard into the bag itself. And then the bag, there's an outer wrap on the bag. That allows us to take a patient uh, who is supine, uh, let's just say they got multiple long bone fractures or whatever, we can lift them straight out. And again, as soon as we close the doors, we're on the way to the trauma center. Trail lines we're gonna use to prevent spinning. Uh, we've all seen some famous uh, videos of people spinning on helicopter hoists. Uh, that is one of the risks. So one of the things that we do to mitigate that is use a trail line. Key thing with the trail line is you're not trying to keep us on the ground, you're just trying to keep us from spinning. So you just need a little bit of slap, a little bit of tension, not crazy. But you are going to have to have gloves. Uh, all of our guys train to explain this to a, uh, a new person, a, a lay person, right? Uh, so that we can basically hand you a bag and give you a quick 30 second uh, explanation of what to do. So you don't have to worry about it too much. Biggest thing here is make sure you got that PPE, make sure you have your gloves. And this is kind of what they do. So the idea here is that we uh, keep them from spinning. So you've got, ideally we'd use two uh, during the daytime. Sometimes we only use one, uh, but we want that 45 degree angle just keeps us from spinning. 
Uh, I don't know what happened to that video there, but it's gone, but okay. Um, one of the major things that we do or that we have with our aircraft is a significant amount of rotor wash. We put, about, we put out about hurricane force winds coming out of the bottom of the aircraft. So we mitigate that on you, or we mitigate that effect on you by trying to stay over that target area for the shortest period of time possible. So we're gonna come in, we're gonna come at start high and then come in low. And hopefully at the same time that we're arriving right over top of you, our rescuer or our hook is getting right there onto the scene. At that point, we're gonna disconnect it and we're gonna leave. Key thing is we should you should be in the worst of the winds for 30 seconds to a minute max. Uh, reality is probably going to be a little bit less than that. Um, so that's one of those things that's important. You, you hear people talk about how severe our rotor wash is. It is important if you're operating with us on a hoist or even on a landing zone, it's important to remember that we have significant rotor wash uh, just because of the size of helicopter that we are. Uh, but we always fly and train to, to try and mitigate it. Final little bits. Uh, there's been some changes with the protocol uh, with the trauma decision tree. Uh, so I just want to review them real quick because that affects a lot of our work. So uh, main thing here, motor GCS less than six, right? So now we are no longer using GCS less than 13. It is now motor GCS less than six. So this is a patient who cannot follow commands, cannot make purposeful movements. So if you're if you're looking at there and you're like, hey, squeeze my hands, and they squeeze your hands, they turn around right right there and do that. Uh, they have a motor GCS of at least six. Um, so they're not at least on that category an alpha. Heart rate greater than systolic blood pressure. That's that uh, shock index that we talked about, right? So shock index is there. Pulse ox less than 90. That one's also new. So pulse ox less than 90 gives us, a, uh, gives us an idea. One of the things that I want to note here is that on this alpha and bravo, it doesn't say anything about 30 minute window or a consult, right? If you're consulting a hospital to ask for a helicopter for an Alpha or Bravo, you're doing too much work, right? An Alpha or Bravo is an automatic launch. You can launch us if it makes sense and it's going to be a clinical benefit to your patient. So the biggest thing is make sure that it makes sense for your patient. Um, and that's another thing, right? We're going to come back when you request us, we're going to come back and tell you, okay, hey, you've got Trooper 1 in 15 minutes. If you turn around and you hear, hey, uh, you've got Trooper 2 in 45 minutes from that incident site that I gave you, you might just want to go ahead and leave, right? If the closest aircraft isn't coming to you or for whatever reason we're delayed, don't wait. Don't sit there with a patient that's packaged ready uh, and ready to go and just waiting for us. If the wheels on the bus go round and round, get that ambulance moving. Um, the biggest thing though, is if the patient has something that we bring, if the patient, if, if there's something that makes clinical sense, we'll do it. It's not a big deal. Just want you guys to always be thinking, all right. Uh, in the category Bravo, so, uh, active bleeding requiring a tourniquet or wound packing, right? That's going to be a Bravo. Um, that's the main difference in the Bravo. Charlie has a couple differences. So fall from height greater than 10 feet, they simplified that one a little bit. And then on high risk auto crash, they simplified a few things there. Uh, one of the main things is like rider separated from transport vehicle with significant impact, uh, the need for extrication other than a door pop, uh, some of those things there. Um, biggest thing though is both of these have a separate criteria. So your Charlies and Deltas, if you're within 30 minutes of a trauma center, do not need to go by air uh, unless you've unless you're unless they're not categorized properly um if they're a true charlie or delta they don't need to go by air if they're within 30 minutes now if you're an hour hour and a half from a trauma center no big deal that's what we're here for um but uh for the most part for the area that i gave you for the scenario you don't need a charlie and delta so if you early activate us you get on scene and turns out it's not as bad as reported uh let's just say they're a charlie because of the extrication that's necessary to get them out but then when you get them out they're basically uninjured Okay, they need to be evaluated at trauma center due to the mechanism, but they don't necessarily need to go by air. Um, and so in that case, you can cancel this. Uh, final slide that I'll throw in there is just that we are always hiring. Uh, we're recruiting just like everybody else. Uh, our pay has just increased. Uh, we've got some really good benefits. They're talking about increasing the amount of pay for a flight medic specifically. Um, so if uh, this has been something that's interesting you, uh, reach out to one of our recruiters, reach out to our website, uh, come, come ask about joining our team because uh, we'll, we'll take all sorts. Um, and uh, we really, uh, uh, this is a really cool program. I really believe in it a lot. It's, uh, it's fun. I like to get a chance to talk about it. So what sort of questions do people have? Where do I apply? 
<laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go back to the slide for the link. We'll, we'll take doctor. <laughs> we'll, we'll go. Let's go. Adam, thank you so much for all the all the work to get this program up and running, as well as for sharing all this great information. Yeah, happy to do it. Who pays for a med flight, and how much on average? Somebody asked. Uh, we don't have so we don't bill any patients ever. Um, so it's it's free um, to the patient. It's twelve dollars out of your motor vehicle registration pays for our services. So everything that we do is covered by $12 out of your motor vehicle registration. Awesome. Are there opportunities for tours on MSP Aviation on the ground? Absolutely. So uh, you can reach out to us um, through a bunch of different means. So this uh, MSP Medics uh, email that I had in my previous slide, let's go back to this one, that MSP Medics right there will get you in contact with somebody who can set up a tour uh, at any of our bases. Uh, we can also come to firehouses. Uh, the biggest thing, like we can fly an aircraft in, give a public demo there. Biggest thing there is we just want more than you know a handful of people. We'd like it to be worth our uh, our fuel because um, it is expensive. But uh, we we don't have a problem. Somebody asked, how do you maintain adequate blood supply and maintain the replacement cycle? Uh, a lot of work. Uh, so the the the. Replacement cycle is basically we get it uh, from the blood bank every every seven days. We have a cooperative agreement, like a contract with the uh, University of Maryland's blood bank via the Red Cross. Um, so they're responsible for giving us uh, giving us blood. Um, we're kind of they they're really they've been fantastic in supporting us. So uh, but it's a give and take. So they'll sometimes tell us like, hey, we don't have as many units, right? We're trying to get 14 total units to put two on every aircraft. They don't have that right now. So that's right. Right now we're running with one on every aircraft. So it's a little bit of a give and take, uh, and we do a lot of driving around. Um, so we're uh, we have uh, we have police cars issued to us. Uh, so if you see a state police car rolling around with AV tags, it might be full of blood, uh, taking them from place to place. Uh, like I said, we uh, we hold uh, about every seven days we swap. Any limitation if a patient meets qualifications for aviation but has communicable disease or hazmat exposure? Uh, communicable disease, disease is not, uh, you just got to communicate it to us. We have N95s. We can, uh, you know, like we can gown up and get and have all the same like uh, equipment that's uh, available to ground units. Hazmat patients, unless they have been thoroughly deconned, uh, we're not going to take them in the aircraft. If particularly if there's any like off gassing or any potential in, uh, way that it could uh, affect the pilots, uh, it's not safe to do so. Um, so if you've got somebody like the one that we get kind of frequently is like a fuel spill. Uh, somebody gets a bunch of diesel fuel doused on them after like a, a rollover MVC. Cut that, cut the patient's pay, uh, clothes off, try and decon as much of it as possible. Uh, and then uh, that's good enough. Right. But you got to decon them in some way. If it's going to be something like, uh, I don't know, like a nerve agent, uh, we'll bring you some supplies, but that's, that's, uh, not safe to take in the aircraft. Uh, have there been any considerations to run calls by ground as an advanced trauma team on down for weather days? Yeah, so uh, we've we've done that. Uh, we've done that kind of as an ad hoc program. So uh, where I used to work down at uh, Trooper 7, um, we would do that pretty, pretty regularly. So we would take all the equipment off the helicopter, put it in one of our police cars, uh, and we'd just show up at scenes. Um, it's a little bit uh, as needed and jurisdictionally dependent. So uh, if the uh, if there's, uh, if there's like, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, if we've got the, if we've got the, uh, like the kind of cooperation with the ground units, we'll do that. No problem. Um, biggest thing is that kind of has to be a little bit pre-planned. So you got to talk to us a little bit ahead of time. The sections have to know we need it. Like, right. Some sections do it. Some sections don't. Um, and a lot of that is just based on the jurisdiction. So like, for example, Trooper 2, we didn't do that much because we were primarily in Prince George's County and they could get to a hospital faster than we could get to them. Probably would be similar to like Baltimore County. I don't know if our crew leaving out of Trooper 1 and Mar and Middle River could get to an incident over there in time. Um, and it's not something that is full out and deployed as like a constant presence. Um, so it's kind of, we, we help where we can. But if we can, we 100% will. Uh, we, we do really enjoy that. And that is something that we have pretty regular discussions about. Dr. Sikorsky says, Adam, Houston's ground EMS has an extensive low titer 
whole blood program without reinventing the wheel? Was there any comms with their program, communication with their program? Yeah, so uh, I know uh, Dr. Flo Care and uh, uh, Sergeant Hines went down to the Whole Blood Academy. I believe that was in, I think that was in San Antonio. Um, but we did, uh, we've done a lot of research, a lot of talk to a bunch of different programs uh, from all around uh, the country. So I don't know if they specifically talked to Houston, uh, but I know that they've talked to a bunch of different programs and in, in, in transport units. We were definitely weren't uh, going out on our own or, or reinventing the wheel. Uh, it's just that some of the, some of the restrictions um, you know, like for example, us changing out every seven days. Um, some of that's done to placate some of our partners around here. So it's just uh, one of those things. Dr. Skorsky, you're welcome to unmute as well if you have anything you want to add. No, I've just been enjoying it. Um, and Adam, you are correct. It was San Antonio. I just sent you a direct message. Sorry oh, yeah, no worries. That. No problem. No problem. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys, I don't see any other questions or comments in the chat. Adam, thank you so much. No problem. Anytime. I hope, hope we connect again soon. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah, you got to come, uh, come fly along again. That would be super fun. You have to come ride. <laughs> true. It's true. If I ever get if I ever get out of here, I'm uh, yeah. So all right, lots of positive comments rolling in. I hope that you're receiving those as well. I think that it's very appreciated uh, all that you do for us. Awesome, great, thank you very much. Have a good night.